Good afternoon and welcome to Talks at Google in Cambridge, Mass. Today it's my great pleasure to introduce Josh Glenn and Tony Leone, one of the co-authors and the designer, respectively, of the Unboard series of books. Along with co-author Elizabeth Foy Larson, Josh and Tony are on a mission to empower kids to appreciate all the world can offer and to help them see how they can add their own magic to it. Their first book, Unboard, The Essential Field Guide to Serious Fun, has been described as the first kid's book to truly encourage a hands-on approach to creating a personally meaningful life. Their third book will be Unboard Adventure. But today they're here to talk about their newly published second book, Unboard Games, Serious Fun for Everyone. I can't adequately describe how amazing it is, I've read it. So I'll just say I wish I'd had it when I was a kid and had it when my kids were young. So please join me in welcoming Josh and Tony. Thank you. I'll let you drive the machine, I guess, Tony. Sure. So um, I'm Josh Glenn. I'm um, born and raised here in Boston in Jamaica Plain. <laughs> Are you from Jamaica Plain? Nice. Nice. I'm from um, Parkside, not Ponsa. <laughs> um, and uh, I, um, I'm a semiotic brand analyst in my real life. And I used to work at the Boston Globe for a long time. I was a columnist and editor for the Ideas section for a long time. And Tony? Tony. Uh, I'm Tony Leone. I'm a graphic designer uh, here in the Boston area. Um, working, uh, I went to MassArt. I graduated from MassArt in 95. And I've been working in Boston uh, ever since. Um, I've done a lot of work over the years, about seven years worth of work with IDEO. They're over in uh, Central Square. Um, but uh, for the past eight years or so, I've been out on my own, running my own studio, and uh, happily working on the onboard books with Josh. So I'm a, I'm a uh, more traditional designer. I'm not so much of a web guy, but more of a um, packaging, uh, publications, books, and, and brand, uh, brand designer. So um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about our creative process actually here today, but then we will also talk about our games book, and, and we can even play a game if you guys want, if we don't run out of time. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, just because we're so fascinated by our own process, <laughs> um, our process of how we, how we made this first book, Unboard, which was a bestseller back in 2012. Yeah. So. Uh, so. Josh and I, uh, we met back in the late 90s, and Josh was running a zine called Hermanot at the time. I got to know Josh because he, he hired me as the art director and designer of issues 15 and 16 uh, of, the, of the zine. And we, what we essentially did was we took, took something that was in a zine format and created more of a journal uh, um, with it. So Josh and I do have a history of working together and especially working together uh, collaboratively on, on public, large publication projects. We did two issues of Hermanot. And um, so we're just you know, giving you a little bit of background as to. And of course, the zine world, the, the, you know, we were DIY, but the ethos, the, the aesthetic was supposed to be very, you know, it wasn't cool to have things that were glossy and color covers and nice layout and all that. And Tony and I were like, that, that's not DIY at all. It's DIY is just. If, 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 you, if you make it yourself and no one's telling you what to do, then it's DIY. You can have it look however you want. So we took, although the zine started as a kind of a, a mimeographed thing for 20 people, we turned it into this very beautiful um, journal that had a circulation of 10,000 before, before the end. Yeah. Uh, so in, in spring of 2010, we, uh, we pitched, um, pitched the book on board. Um, and the idea was that it was the best of the old and the best of the new. Josh, I'll let you take this part of it. Yeah, so, um, you know, there was this book that was very popular around that time, The Dangerous Book for Boys, that was very nostalgic. And I had my kids at that time where my two sons were aged 12 and 10, and they had been given, I think, three copies of that book by usually like grandparents or aunts or uncles or other people who were kind of worried about how kids are growing up these days. They felt like, Supposedly, kids these days spend all their time on TV or on screens or video games, the internet. They don't go outside. Parents overparent, and they're worried about letting their kids run around outside and be in the woods. And there's a lot of nostalgia for the good old days of childhood. So the Dangerous Book for Boys was a huge publishing phenomenon. And what frustrated me and, and Tony and, and our co-author, Elizabeth Larson, who couldn't be here because she lives in Minneapolis, what frustrated us about books like that and a lot of imitated books that imitated it that have come out since then 
is that they're just a nostalgia trip. They're very, they're very afraid of the present, and so their reaction to the present, not that the criticism of the present is wrong necessarily, but the reaction was to retreat into the past, into this nostalgic idea of how childhood used to be. And we wanted um, books for our kids that were about now, you know, that were about, that, that, that weren't hypocritical. And we use the computer, or we let our kids use the computer. We like games, video games, and, you know, um, so we wanted books that would have, have some of that good old fashioned kind of outdoor, no screen, uh, low tech activities for kids. We wanted it to be realistic too and kind of have it be, uh, do a, have a book that would be a way of exploring the world together with our kids and that book didn't really exist. So we pitched this best of the old, best of the new idea to Bloomsbury. Yeah, and um, so in order to pitch the book, we, we Josh wrote a couple of uh, uh, articles and I designed some very loose, rough, spreads of what, what it might look like. So we chose the game for, uh, Foursquare. So Josh, Josh wrote an article about Foursquare. As an example of an old-fashioned game that doesn't require any technology or screens. Exactly. And then we did Foursquare the app. <laughs> <laughs> Which my kids and I use, even though it, at the time it was really sort of a way for people in their 20s to find their friends and to brag about how many bars you've been to that night or whatever. My kids and I use Foursquare all the time because it was a way to force us out of our normal routines. So if we were in Brookline and dropping one of my kids off at his base lesson and my other son and I had an hour to kill, we would use Foursquare and say, hey, no one's checked into this graveyard. Let's go into the graveyard and check in there. So we turned it into like a fun way for me and an eight-year-old to spend time together um, exploring the world and using an app to do it. So to us, that doesn't seem like a bad thing. It seems like a good thing. Yeah. And just to say a little bit about the design of these spreads, um, uh, the editor we were working with at Bloomsbury, he, he called us a pretty much about, I would say about two days before our, our meeting, and he's like, oh, it'd be great if you had some visuals to go, come along with your pitch. So we hurriedly put these together, um, and, it, and it really raised a lot of questions as, as to what, what this book should look like, and um, we, we'll talk a little more about that in a, in a bit. So, uh, so we, we, we pitched the book, um, we got a contract that summer, and as, as I typically start with any, any large-scale design project, and, and Josh does in his work, we did, we did a lot of research. Um, and I spent uh, a good several weeks um, researching the market segment of uh, kids and family activity books. Um, and I, I scoured the market, and I just collected image, images and spreads from all the books. And very quickly, a, a series of, of themes came up. So we broke it out into uh, nostalgic. So this is the dangerous book for boys, the daring book for girls, the, uh, the field and forest, the handy books, which is a, a pretty famous series. Um, there's another, another theme emerged, which was appropriated or retro. So there's the, the uh, popular mechanics, the, you know, the boy scientist, the girl mechanic. Um, the uh, worst case scenario handbooks where they're, they're meant to look like you know, survival guides, uh, the zombie survival guide. Um, another style that came up was styled, for lack of a better word, a styled graphic illustration where they're, they were designed or created by, by designers who are you know, half designer and half illustrator and they, they kind of created their own very, um, their own look that, but that had a very computer, computer centric sort of illustration style. Um, eclectic collage. This is very much the DK books for kids. DK published has a is, has mastered this look um, for kids. So we knew knew right away we did we wanted to maybe do some of this, but we didn't we didn't want to be you know be just another DK type of book. Um, they you know again they, they master it, so we had found a lot of that stuff. Um, uh, another uh, feature that came up was this contemporary, what I called contemporary technical, and this is very much like the uh, you're you're on a flight in the airplane and it's sort of the emergency exit pamphlet in the in the airplanes is that type of illustration, um, and then uh, certainly just modern design, you know, so things that aren't necessarily a, a particular style, but just you know created by designers like the ready-made books and the ready-made magazines, great, all of Ellen Lupton's books for kids are great. Um, and here's a, a series more. The Mini Weapons of Mass Destruction are great books, Geek Dads, and then certainly Make Magazine as well. And then lastly, um, illustrated characters. You know, uh, the, the sort of classic way to reach out to kids is through you know, some sort of cartoon-like character um, or characters that sort of run you through either a lesson or an activity. Here's some more here, the middle, middle School Confidential. And then there's a lot of stuff like the Oh Yikes books, like you know, stuff that's cartoony or meant to be gross or silly. Uh, that's, that was another theme that started to emerge. And, and lastly, more these are these are illustrated character books, but yet they're they're more stuff almost you would see in your like high school guidance counselor's office or a doctor's office or something. You know, boys' guide to becoming a teen. 
And you know, we, we knew right away this is not, not where we wanted to be. So to be clear, those are all good, those are all good books that we looked at, and they're all good, perfectly good illustration styles. So our question is, what do we want? What's right for our book? And one thing I love about working with Tony is he and I are both very like left brain and right brain. So we're we're very creative and imaginative, but we're also very analytical and like to do our research. In fact, Tony's wife complains to me sometimes that when they when they frame a picture, it takes like six months to get it hung up on the wall because Tony's like thinking, planning each wall, studying. Um, but I like that. So um, we did a lot of research, and then I decided to use some of the tools that I use in my work as a semiotic brand analyst to, um, to uh, look at the stimulus, the data that Tony had collected. So this is the next step that we took. Yeah. Um, so what I do in my work is um, I use the tools of semiotic analysis to um, surface critical insights for marketers and branders and organizations, anybody who has a, a brand that they're trying to get out there, to help them understand the context in which they're operating. There's a saying in marketing, I don't, I'm not actually in marketing, but I consult the marketers, that it doesn't matter what your brand communicates, what matters is what um, the consumer hears. Because there's a gap between what you say and what they hear, and that gap is filled with culture. There's all this unspoken network of codes and assumptions and um, you know ways of thinking that, that um, Effect and influence and drive our understanding and our interpretation of everything that we're that is sent to us, whether it's from culture or from marketing. So, um, what I do in my work is is do a deep dive into you know a category, all the images and visuals of whether it's uh, the beer category or automotive or more like a cultural territory like reddishness or luxury, and I surface all these codes and then map them, trying to find the deep underlying themes of the of that category, and then that kind of becomes a strategic tool that I can hand over to the marketing people or the brand stakeholders and they can kind of have a sense of where they want to operate and how they can operate. So I said, well, why don't I just use that same tool for Tony's uh, work? So, I, so that's what we did. So one, one big underlying um, binary opposition that we, just, that we d determined was in the uh, world of kids' books at that time that we did the, the study was um, a big opposition between silly books and earnest books. So on the one hand, there was books that are very much like for kids only, like the oh yuck type of books, boys only, like parents not invited basically was the message of these kind of books. It's the kind of thing you would give to your kids and hopefully they would leave you alone for a while, which is obviously not what we wanted to do. We wanted a project for kids that you could do with parents. The other end of that spectrum was kind of earnest, very earnest books that were um, kind of parent for parents and they were sort of uh, parenting guides. Um, and not that fun for the kids. And then somewhere in the, right in the center are, is probably a sweet spot. Unfortunately, as you're approaching the center, if you don't hit that sweet spot exactly, it can feel very phony and contrived on the way in there, we discovered. And then the other big continuum um, is between permissive and authoritarian. This is more about parenting styles. So in the world of parenting, as any of you are parents know probably, the, the three parenting styles that you hear people talk about are permissive where you let your kid do whatever they want, um, authoritarian, where you're authoritarian and you're cracking the whip. And then authoritative is the sort of in-between place where you're not letting your kids run wild, you're not cracking the whip, you're trying to find the, a balance between those two things. And again, there's a lot of books that are about sort of, because there was a, kind of a backlash going on at that time against over-parenting and helicopter parenting, quite a lot of books that were sort of anti-authoritarian. Um, and then there's a lot of books that are very like, um, you know, like, like the, these old, boy scientist books that were getting reissued and stuff that are sort of, here's, here's how to do cool projects. We have to follow these rules exactly. There's no room for wiggle room. And there are some books in the middle, like Meg Magazine, DIY Kids, that we felt were sort of hitting that sweet spot between the two, where it's fun and you can kind of, there's guidelines, but you don't have to follow exactly, and there's room for experimentation and play. So you put, in my world, I put the two codes of two binary oppositions together and you get a four quadrant map. So where silly meets authoritarian, we were calling it the cajoling section in the bottom left. And these are um, kids' books that were sort of fun teacher, the camp counselor, maybe a cool cousin at best. <laughs> so the green ones are kind of, the far, that are farthest out are sort of lame categories, sort of extreme versions of that quadrant. The yellow uh, codes that you're seeing here are kind of the middle of the row, which can seem a little phony and contrived. And then the blue ones seem pretty cool to us. So at, the, at best, in the cajoling quadrant, you have like a cool older cousin. I had cool older cousins in the 70s who, you know, they're, they're, they're cooler than your teacher or a camp counselor. They're showing you something that maybe is kind of dangerous that your parents wouldn't let you do normally. It's exciting. 
Uh, but, they may be, but they may be getting you out of your comfort zone, which is a good thing. One, one thing we did here, too, is we, um, we assigned personas to some of these uh, the, on, on the map here as well. And it, and it helps from a design standpoint, is once we start going into design, it starts to give a sense as to you know, who, are we, who are we trying to target and what, you know, who is it being designed for. To, so to apply personas here is a, is a, it's a nice tool in the design process. So in the top left, where permissive meets silly, this is the wacky quadrant. And there's quite a popular quadrant for kids' books. Uh, we were saying like the worst of it is like the creepy uncle, like a book, like oh yuck is something that like maybe an uh, uncle with bad boundaries would give to your kid and you kind of be bummed out that he had given that to your kid. Um, kitsch is somewhere in the middle and then the kooky aunt, we think that's a really good thing to be a kooky aunt. So that's a good version of wacky. Then in the top right where permissive meets earnest, this is like Sherpa parenting as people were calling it back then. So it's sort of hippie parents, slacker moms, low key. And we felt like maybe there was like a white space there or something. It, there wasn't really a cool version of that quadrant yet. And then um, authoritarian meets earnest. This is what we call the particular quadrant. This is like fussy grandparents, helicopter parents. At best, maybe with the grandparents or geeky and crafty parents like Mark Fraunfelder from Make doing stuff with his daughter sort of would fit there. So that gives us a map. Then we layered Tony's research on top of, of that map. And we decided that there was an opportunity to do something that fit with our values as parents and as, some, as people who wanted to do a book that was different. And it also, there was an opportunity. No one else was doing something in this space. Um, it's sort of a little more earnest than the kooky aunt, a little more permissive maybe than the geeky and crafty parents. Like it's a little easier stuff to do. You don't have to follow all these rules exactly. Um, but it's not, and so it's maybe a little bit on the, on the serious side, but not all the way to earnest, and a little bit on the permissive side, but not, but you know, sort of fun authoritative, but not all the way towards permissive. Um, yeah, no, that's so we were taking our, we decided to take our uh, inspiration from the books that were kind of right around that area. Opportunity. And so, so this is our opportunity area. So this is all, we're making it sound like we did this a kind of like creepy adult, like coming in from the outside and studying the kids category. But it was also, the idea was to try to articulate and put language and visuals to our own parenting philosophy and what we wanted this book to be. Mm -hmm. So then the design codes we mapped on here. Do you want to talk about this, Tony? Oh, sure. Uh, here, what, what we're able to do is, um, as, as we mapped the, the imagery of, images of the books from my research on here, we were able to take, those, um, take the, the themes that emerged and map the themes on here as well, just to, to help further articulate it. So around our sweet spot, you know, we saw, thought maybe some contemporary, technical, some certainly contemporary, modern, a little bit of nostalgia. Um, and the idea of um, the, the idea of something being undesigned, uh, you know, it's, it certainly is designed, but it's it's not um, not over. There's a certain simplicity to it that um, that lends itself. Our big our big example really of that was like the Whole Earth Catalog. Yeah, the Whole like Earth Catalog that we grew up with, yeah. like the Zoom Do books in the '70s and the Whole Earth Catalog. Yeah, they are they are designed, but they look undesigned. They look kind of pasted down and on purpose. Yeah. yeah. So uh, from from there we went into um, inspiration. Um, you know, what's, what's, where, do, where do we take all this research? Where do we take the sort of the semiotic analysis and, and what, what's going to inspire us visually um, against all these codes? So I, again, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much what I do with any, any large scale design project. So we, we looked at doodle like, you know, we want the doodle like illustration. The idea being that we would hire professional illustrators and it would certainly be done, you know, in a professional way, but it would have a much more approachable look, almost as if a, a kid could have drawn it. My, my son can't draw anything quite as cool as this, but he could certainly aspire to it. Um, uh, certainly the idea of scrapbooks and collage, so those are just uh, images I, f I found around uh, the internet and through research of you know, just some, something that might inspire color or a juxtaposition of imagery. Uh, certainly hand-drawn typographic textures, um, you know, uh, it's, it, with the idea of a, a DIY, something that felt had, a, had the maker's hand involved that some of the typography might be nice. Um, cool books, DIY feel, and again, you know, the, cre the creator's hand. So this, this really started to lead us down a trail of like what we wanted our illustration style to look like. If you remember in the, the first spreads we put together to the, for the pitch, it had a very technical sort of feel to it. But after our, our research and the semiotic analysis, we decided we wanted something very, very much uh, with a hand quality feel to it. Uh, so that led us to two illustrators, uh, the first being uh, Mr. Mr. Roosh. His name, actual name is Mark Roosh, but his, his illustration name is Mr. Roosh. Um, the, the interesting thing about the two illustrators we brought onto the project is, is neither of them have the style that you currently see in the book. So Mark's style, um, it's very um, you know, ha hand-drawn, but, but very painterly. He tends to paint a lot, of, a lot of his work, even his black and white work at the bottom. Um, 
day. Done a lot of work for video games, snowboards. Yeah, Burton snowboards, um, Rock uh, band. shoes. Uh, Ni I think he's done a little bit of work for Nike, but it's a very painterly style. So I, uh, he's someone I know, I know personally. So I asked him if, if can can he do something more sketchy. So we, we gave each of the illustrators a um, an assignment as, as like draw some objects, musical instruments, um, sewing supplies. I knew we knew we knew some of these things were going to be appearing in the books. Sewing supplies and camping equipment. So Mark did Mark did a great and, job. And poor Mark had just broken his wrist sledding right when Tony was asking him to do this, and he didn't want to tell us. Yeah, he didn't he didn't tell us he had broken his right so right hand. So he drew all these in his, with, with his, his left, left hand. hand, and he drew them really big because he could have more control with his left hand, and he scanned them and, and shrunk them. Yeah, he didn't tell us like a year later. Yeah, we didn't find out because he really wanted the project. Um, Heather is another. We we all knew each other from back in the Mass Art days. And I do want to say, I, you know, we did. I didn't just go to my friends for this project. We actually did research, and I contacted some uh, pretty well-known illustrators in New York. And after after looking at this other these other illustrators' work, I was like, I was like, I really think people I know can actually do what we're looking for. So that's why I said we 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 more or less gave them a test. Heather's Heather's more of a fine artist and a an art educator. Art educator. She teaches um, art in the Springfield. Uh, mass um, high school system, but she, uh, I, I knew her from back at Mass Art. I knew she had a, a knew she, she could do what we were looking for. So these are some of her sketchbooks. Um, these are some, she does these beautiful giant cut paper illustrations that are uh, uh, more or less installations. There's some of her black and white work. So I, we gave her the same test. So she drew some uh, camping equipment, uh, some sewing supplies, and she drew, actually drew some four square stuff for us. So, um, so after all of this, um, we had gotten the contract, and we wanted we needed to get uh, Bloomsbury is the publisher. Bloomsbury is the publisher, so we need to get uh, buy-in by Bloomsbury for the design of the book. So we put together some rough spreads using Heather's and Mark's work. We should whip through this part. Yeah, we want to get to games. Yeah. So Bloomsbury gave us the go. They gave us the thumbs up. They said, "Go for it," except for the cover. In the world of books, um, the, the covers, uh, more than anything else, was dictated by the marketing department. So we went shifted from working with our editor to working with the team in marketing and our editor. So um, the a cover- long, painful process. It was a long, painful process. So I'll just, I'll just go through um, quickly all the iterations of the cover. All the, and the marketing department also gets to decide the title of the book. This was our working title. This is the working title. Uh, there, there was a, go back to that one. Yeah, Every now was, and then they would say, try something with a circle, like a maze. So a maze tried, and every, a circle. <laughs> we tried everything they told us. Yeah. I love all these covers, by the way. Yeah. Any one of these would have made a great cover. Uh, we ended on this one, and the, the editor loved this one, um, though at that point uh, he said, can you send me some titles? So after a long iteration of covers, then he wanted to look at titles. Uh, we came up with a lot, a lot of names, a lot of names. Uh, he said, more better, he said. Yeah. And then he came at us with the Young Kicker's Guide to the Sweet Life. Um, we just, we like to remember that because we like to make fun of him for saying yeah, that. Yeah, we're, we're, still, we're still on our list to make shirts that say the Young Kicker's Guide to the yeah. Sweet Life. So, uh, so we went back with more names and uh, Freestyle, the Backpack Rebellion, on board and the Yeah Manifesto uh, started to, to emerge. And on board was almost like a joke name at that point and this long list of yeah. names, but we liked it because it was kind of punk rock. Yeah, like, like the, the Unsane or something. Or, or the Unwound, yeah. Uh, so we tried some of, in, some of them in, in the covers of the style that we liked. And we, this is we, so cool, we should have done this one. Yeah, exactly. Go back to that one. The this Yeah one? Manifesto, isn't that a good name for a book? <laughs> we were like making up what Y-E-H stood for, like young, entrepreneurial, whatever. whatever. <laughs> they said no. <laughs> So uh, as, you know, so we, can't, we we got pretty close here. Tried some different treatments, um, and here we got really close. And finally, we got it. We got a real book. Yeah. This this is the book. So. It has a nice holographic. Um, what's it called? Foil. Holo holographic oh, foil. Yep, to lend some color. Um, and here's uh, here's some spreads from the book. We hired um, a lettering illustrator named Chris Piasek. He lives in Western Mass. Um, great guy. He was a designer um, who's who's now all he does is uh, hand lettering. So he's more more or less an illust uh, hand letter or illustrator these days. But he did all our divider pages for us. So that's that hand drawn typography from our inspiration slides. Um, here's some of Mark's illustrations about how to how to rock out, written by someone who um, who runs a, a a rock school for kids. Uh, Soak and Destroy by uh, John Edgar Park from Make Magazine, uh, an article on young adult novels. 
Uh, the, the, there's a series of nice spreads in the, in the, the large book, uh, the first book on board, um, that are timelines. So I had this idea for this one. It's one of our, our first ideas for illustration to do um, a timeline as if you were standing on your back por porch looking across a series of backyards and all the uh, objects that are featured in the timeline show up and in, in that you know, kids and families are playing in the backyard. Uh, article uh, Step Up with uh, Rebecca Walker. Article How to Make Zines. More crispy acid work just because it's so great. Um, and a uh, beautiful illustration by Heather here of um, a Chinese uh, New Year dragon. Thank you. So Tony doesn't look to his own horn, but he won three prestigious design awards for this book. Um, so all that like research Thank paid you. off. <laughs> Thank you. And um, the book sold really well, and so they asked us to do a series of spin-offs, um, smaller paperbacks that were actually more like what we originally conceived of as a field guide, like something you actually take out with you, kind of waterproof, you could have it in your pocket almost. Yeah. And um, we decided to start with one on games because, uh, especially in my case, as my kids are now older, my kids are 12 and 10 when I started, and they are now uh, 16 and 14, and they are getting out of this age range of these books. These books are sort of for 8 to 12 year olds, and um, but games is one thing that my kids will still do with me anytime. So we thought that games was a good um, family activity book to do. We're going to do another one on adventure. Yeah. We're not sure after that. So um, in the spirit of the games book, does anyone want to play one of our games? Let's play a little game while we still have a few more minutes. So it's a, it's a, um, I'll make Jane McGonagall make everyone play a game. It's a, uh, it's a um, low tech um, parlor game called um, uh, Telephone Pictionary. So it's like the game Telephone, where you know, as you whisper a word to someone and it goes along the line, it gets more and more, it gets far and far away from what, how it started. And it's like Pictionary, in which you're drawing a picture of something that someone else is trying to communicate to you, but you might not always know exactly what that is. So um, the way this game works is that um, ooh, me. the first person uh, will write a, a sentence here or some kind of phrase. It could be like, the cat walked on the moon. The um, you know, grandma was roller skating, just something like that. You hand that pad to somebody else. They turn the page, and they draw a picture of what you said. Okay, So it's, so it's a sentence and then a picture. You then hand the picture to somebody else. They don't know what the first sentence was. All they can see is your picture. So they then turn the page and write a sentence based on what they think the picture is and so forth. So when you get handed a pad, if it's got a sentence here, you do a picture. If it's got a picture here, you do a sentence. All right. And the first person who gets the pad has to write a phrase. Any questions? All right, I'm going to pass out three different ones. Josh, I can pass them this way. OK. Yeah. Do you have a mark? Uh, you get to start. Here, you want to go? Um, you want to? All right. Parlor game. While well, right. while you guys are starting, I'll talk a little bit about the game. Yeah, it starts book. with the sentence. Some some sort of statement. Yeah. So some kind of evocative phrase yeah, or sentence, marker, short, want. Want that can get someone to draw a picture. So the games book picks up on some of the. Um, obviously, it looks a lot like the onboard book. And it picks up on some of the same kind of um, rubrics that we develop. Like we have best ever lists like of our favorite novels, our favorite board games. For this one, we have so many favorite board games, we broke it into like favorite cooperative board games, favorite quick board games, favorite reboots of board games. Um, we have a lot of, I think maybe 75 or 80 game instructions in here. And again, we try not to be too instructive, so we sort of give guidelines for how to play the game. And then we really encourage, we usually have a little sidebar that has some hacks of the game, and then we encourage the kids and their parents to invent their own hacks for the games. And um, we have um, co comics that um, tell the history of various things. So here's like a history of board games that's told in comics. We have how-to, sort of make magazine style how-to um, articles um, with photos. Um, <laughs> So there's just so much in these uh, in these little books, and th th I think it took us like a year to do. Here's a duct tape, a game out of duct tape. Here's a rocket launching game that my um, brother-in-law, who's a teaches math in the Boston Public Schools, uses to teach it, teach uh, angles. They have to make a, a very dangerous actually launcher out of PVC pipe, which we thought was safe because he had a book from NASA about how to do it. But after this book came out, we realized that NASA had recalled that book. So. <laughs> Um, geo games, you know, GPS type games, geocaching. I think there's even the Google Earth um, game section in here. So um, one thing about we like about 
parlor games, which is the game that we're passing around now, is that um, parlor games just inherently brings you know the family together because you're all facing each other in a circle. You're not distracted by any screens. You don't have any. You're not even looking at a board. You're usually, it's just oftentimes there's no um, equipment at all, or maybe just a pencil and a piece of paper. There's a, there's a bunch of in here that our families like to play. And the nice thing about family game night um, is that. It's just an amazing way to for a family to affirm that you all like each other because you don't have to do it. You know what I mean? It's this. There's no reason to do a family game night. It doesn't. It's not helpful. It's not productive. It's not doing chores. It's not creating something. Um, it's just doing having fun together on a on a school night, and um, that's really nice. Actually, it's a nice little break to have uh, for your family once in a while to make that happen. All right. How are we doing on the uh, the uh, pads? All right, let's let him go a little farther. Um, well, go ahead. One thing I just wanted to add about our books as well is that Josh and I both came out of the uh, the zine world from the the 90s. You know, we I worked on a punk zine um, in the early 90s, and um, we're both out of the the punk and hardcore scene from the 80s. So our, our book uh, from the beginning, we wanted it to have this sort of eclectic feel, where, where it has excerpts from old books, and and as Josh was saying, it's got you know game theory, game activities. So it, it was designed uh, to be simple enough to incorporate all of these. Um, sort of divergent uh, pieces of content. Yeah, it ended up being actually quite complex sort of structurally, yeah. Yeah. the book, because it's, and the way Tony finally, you know, uh, on the first book as we finally got to the end of the finish line there was the idea ended up being kind of, it's supposed to look like a, an old fashioned manual of how to do stuff, but then somebody's hacked it by scribbling notes on it and or, or, or sort of redrawing it, redrawing it yeah. and crossing things out and yeah. ripping things out of other pages and sticking them in like you might do with your cookbook, like recipes. So there's a lot of things that look taped in or that are done on torn paper or graph paper. Yeah, there's a lot of torn paper texture in there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're hoping at sort of a subliminal level. Again, kids will get the idea that you know what we're trying to teach through these books is is DIY, the same thing that we, Tony and I did back when we met in the '90s. Like doing it yourself is much more fun than doing than buying something that's already made for you. And even if it doesn't look as good or perfect um, or as the final as the sort of fancy finished product that you buy, that's fine. That's actually part of the charm of it is that it's you made it, and it, all the rough edges are part of what you like so much about it. So we wanted the book, even though it's a beautiful book, to have some kind of that rough edge look. Um, going on inside of it. Let's take questions now while we're doing this. Yeah, JP. Did I, yeah. Yeah. Did I get out? Oh, sure. Okay. Sure. All right. So um, I guess I have two two questions. You could choose whichever one you want. First one is um, you obviously spent a lot of time thinking about like the design, the, mm -hmm. not just the package, but just the whole, the, the brand, everything, mm -hmm. the whole feel. Um, but the the content obviously is like really important. Did you? Did you just take things from your life? Did you source? Did you like go online and uh, did you crowdsource it? Did you test everything? Um, obviously, like the content kind of makes or breaks it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other question is kind of content based. Like you have all these people doing, uh, like Zay Frank or Rain Wilson doing these like put a challenge out online and all of our people go out and see like take a pic, dress your vacuum up like your mom, mm -hmm. take a photo, and then you have this resource of 10,000 photos of this funny thing. Mm -hmm. um, did you guys like, you obviously went for the book format. Are you doing like, do you know what's happening in the wild or do you care or are you getting people to send things in or to contribute back or like, or is it just like this is, this is for you to, for your world and you go and use it as you wish? Yeah, well to take the second question first, we would love to have a super robust like online community like that where we could put out a challenge and have people send it in. And we've had a little bit of success with that through our website. However, because we're working with a, a big corporate publisher and because they're very, very worried about you know um, an, un, an unmonitored space where children would be interacting with adults, yeah. there's a lot of worries about that. So we, we can't kind of can't do that on our website. Um, we're trying to be careful about that. So we do sort of what we do is. On our in our books and on our website and these, and actually we're producing what we're about to talk about what we're doing. I think so. We're, we're in the process of producing uh, two toy kits at the, at the moment. Yeah, so it'll be out activity. next year. And um, what we're doing is basically saying, you know, we'd love to see what you made. Post it online with the following hashtag. But we're not going to we're not saying post it to our site or send it to us. Just wherever you put it, we'll find it. Yeah. So yes, that's the answer to that. And then as far as the content goes, the idea was. Um, 
partly to kind of capture all the fun that we were having as parenting, me and Elizabeth and Tony with our kids at that time. So a lot of it is basically from our own lives. And yes, it's all it, we did all the activities that are in the book. We tested them all with our kids or with our kids' friends or our, our nieces and nephews. And then, um, then we were also kind of harvesting our own memories of childhood. So we were getting a little bit into that kind of dangerous book for boys sort of nostalgia for the when we were kids and our parents weren't paying any attention to us and we were running wild in the woods all summer. So we could capture a lot of that stuff too. And then Elizabeth and I are both very nerdy researcher type people too. So there was quite a bit of like looking up historical games and mm -hmm. um, reading books about games from the 1930s and testing with our kids. So that was and, kind of how we did the content. And we did invite in, uh, or, or Josh and Elizabeth did through their their own connections, um, experts in certain areas. Like Jan John Edgar Park did two articles, and he's he's a he's a contributor to Make Magazine. Um, uh, Rebecca Walker. So you know, there, there's experts in their own That's fields. True. For like, the first book, we had, ended up having like 30 contributors. I didn't yeah. even mention that, but we have um, like we wanted to do a thing on citizen science projects, so we got a scientist to to write about all her favorite citizen science projects. So yeah, uh, we had like a knitting expert do, or someone who has like a website about knitting do a whole project on knitting for the kids. Yeah, in this book, we only have four of those, but we had a lot in the first book, a lot of outside experts. All right, let's bring up those uh, pads and show what we have. Thank you. <laughs> cool, thanks. Right, one more coming, Josh. We start. Yeah. <clears throat> she won I'm not going to pre-screen these, so hopefully it's all. PG. <laughs> she wondered how, what does this say? Harry, it could possibly be. <laughs> oh, Rainy, does it say? I think the person read it as Rainy. So here's the person wondering how Rainy it could possibly be. And that got turned into Rain or Shine. That makes sense which got turned into rain or shine image. Oh, that person got it, rain or shine. <laughs> How many ways can you show rain or shine? <laughs> Is it raining or sunny turned into? I think that's where we ended up. So this started with, um, she wondered how hairy it could possibly be. <laughs> See, here, here we've got uh, the cat jumped over the igloo. <laughs> and a great drawing of a cat jumping over an igloo. You guys are good illustrators, by the way. We do these events with kids, and you get these little tiny stick figure illustrations in the middle. The cat jumped over the igloo. <laughs> and another great illustration of a cat jumping over the igloo. Yeah, and people are good at this kind of. This one, this one stayed on course. <laughs> right, here's the old man struggled to push his shopping cart. Okay. Sad, frowny guy with sort of a hunchback pushing a shopping cart. Help, I've fallen and my breadstick is escaping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this shows somebody sort of falling <laughs> off a ladder and there's a breadstick with arms and legs running away. That's great. I like the breadstick. A pretzel saw a boy fall off a ladder. <laughs> Makes sense. And there it is, pretzel looking at the boy, pretzel with eyes. That's looking great. At the boy falling off a ladder. So yeah, obviously this can go on and on. Sometimes when I go to like large family gatherings, we'll get a couple of these pads going and sit, everyone's sitting in a circle and while we're talking about something else or even eating dinner, you can kind of pass these around the circle and then it, it has hilarity at the end, especially when kids are drawing the pictures. Yeah, exactly. All right, that's our presentation. I think we just made it under the wire. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Any questions? Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>